The Institute. Institute. Institute for Justice. The National Law Firm for Liberty. Hello and welcome to Short Circuit, your mostly bi-weekly podcast on the Federal Courts of Appeal. This week, we're happy to present a special Fifth Circuit extravaganza recorded live before an audience of law students at the University of Texas in Austin. Many thanks to the UT Austin chapter of the Federalist Society for the invitation. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, welcome to the live recording of uh, the Short Circuit podcast, uh, the one and, as far as we know, only podcast about the Federal Circuit Courts of Appeal. I'm Anya Bidwo, uh, filling in for John Ross, our regular host of the show. This time, we decided to go with someone who has an accent. And John, for once, does not fit the bill. <laughs> But he is in charge of the sound to make sure that my accent um, or my volume do not get out of control. The federal appellate courts release about 6,000 opinions a year. And here at IJ, we, John Ross, read them all because you don't want to. So subscribe to our weekly newsletter at shortcircuit.org where we bring you 15 to 20 most interesting circuit court opinions each week, and then talk about them here on the podcast. So for example, each one of the four opinions that we're going to discuss here today was at some point briefed by Ross in his newsletter. Also, if you want to clerk for the Institute for Justice in the summer, the application season opens in November. Our summer clerkships provide for a great opportunity to get, you hand, to get your hands dirty practicing cutting edge constitutional litigation. Simply Google IJ summer clerkship and you'll find all the information you need. We are recording today's podcast live at the University of Texas School of Law. Thank you to the student chapter of FETSOC for hosting us. Uh, we will discuss the Fifth Circuit in general. Uh, I will ask some trivia questions of our panelists, and then we will dive into uh, the four cases that we will be discussing. So our wonderful panelists are Jane Weber. She is a partner at Scott Douglas and McConico. She handles most of the firm's appeals, including in the Fifth Circuit and the US Supreme Court. Jane um, prevailed as counsel for petitioners in Gunn versus Minton, a very interesting uh, Supreme Court case uh, involving jurisdiction of state courts. Uh, she clerked for Judge Reynaldo Garza on the Fifth Circuit, a Jimmy Carter appointee. Jane is a UT law grad. Welcome, Jane. Thank you. Really quickly, what did you like most about clerking for the uh, uh, Fifth Circuit or Judge Garza? Um, uh, everything, and but but in particular, the um, I'm a person who I'm an old soul with a sense of history, and I um, came into my clerkship with a deep respect for the judge I was clerking for, who was the first Mexican American Article III judge in the history of the United States. He was John F. Kennedy's first judicial appointee. He had been a federal judge longer than I have been alive. Um, and he also was a part of the Fifth Circuit at the very end of the Jimmy Carter administration when the Fifth Circuit was, ex the, was expanded in order to create the Eleventh Circuit. And there was a class of judges appointed all at the same time, Judge Garza, Judge Reevely, Judge King, Judge Sam Johnson, Judge Jerry Williams, who were titans. And, and to get to come in and be a part of that, the Fifth Circuit in that snapshot, I sort of feel like it's a, um, I had this wonderful opportunity of Camelot. For one brief shining moment, I got to be a law clerk in that environment, and uh, I respect that. And when I go to the Fifth Circuit for argument, I'm going in a couple of weeks, I go and I find the portraits of all those judges who I got to work with and, and uh, see in action and be on panels with. And that's sort of my relationship with the Fifth Circuit. Excellent, thank you. Our next panelist is Carl Hawkins. He is the current Solicitor General of Texas. Prior to this appointment, he served as an assistant to Solicitor General Scott Keller. He clerked for the Fifth Circuit's Edith Jones and also on the US Supreme Court for Sam Alito, a graduate of the University of Minnesota Law School. Um, Kyle also worked in the appellate and constitutional law practice group of Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher. Welcome, Kyle. Same question to you. What did you like most about clerking for Judge Jones? 
Uh, I cannot possibly improve on the answer that Jane gave. My answer is basically the same as Jane's, but for Judge Jones. She was a fantastic mentor, and to go into that chambers every day and learn from her was a dream come true. I've never had an experience like that, and it's by far the best part. I'd encourage anyone in this room to clerk. It's a great experience. You won't regret it. Excellent, thank you. Steve Vladek, you know him very well. He is a constitutional law professor here at UT. Um, he, he's teaching and research focus on federal jurisdiction, constitutional law, national security law, and military justice. He was just at the US Supreme Court last term. He argued Dalmatsi versus United States. Uh, together with Professor Bobby Chesney, uh, Steve co-hosts the popular national security law podcast. So he's no stranger to this format. Uh, Steve graduated from Yale Law School, and he clerked for two judges, on the, one on the Ninth Circuit and another one on the Eleventh Circuit. Steve, you and Evan Young, uh, your co-panelists, go way back. Could you briefly share uh, this start with the audience? Yes. Uh, so uh, Evan and I were, were uh, classmates in law school. Uh, we were dorm mates as one else, because believe it or not, there are law schools that have dorms. Um, <laughs> perish the thought. Um, and, and I think the... Um, we knew then that, that some, sometime in our professional lives we'd end up on a panel together talking about the Fifth Circuit. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I think we also knew then that we would have uh, radically opposing views about uh, whatever the right answer was to whatever question we were asking. <laughs> Whoa, that's great. We have so much to look forward to. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so our final panelist is Evan Young. You guys know him as a law professor teaching Fed courts here at UT. He is also partner at Baker Botts. He is its chair of the Supreme Court and constitutional law practice. Evan graduated from Yale Law School and uh, served as a law clerk to Judge Harvey, Harvey Wilkinson on the Fourth Circuit, and then to Justice Antonin Scalia at the US Supreme Court. Uh, Evan also worked uh, for DOJ. While there, he, among other things, worked to assist the Iraqi government in its efforts to strengthen its legal regime, including its courts and prison system. Evan's wife, Toby Young, is clerking for uh, Justice Gorsuch. Uh, so you are sort of a uh, one foot is in Austin, another one in Washington, DC. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but which one do you like better? Right now, my two-year-old daughter is in Washington, D.C., so that pretty much gets the, uh, the vote. Whenever I don't need to be anywhere else, I'm going to be there. <laughs> that makes sense. That makes uh, all the sense in the world. Better water right now, too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can bake her. Bring some back with you. Uh, so let's uh, uh, start with just a general question about the Fifth Circuit. Uh, so we had quite a bit of a turnover in the past two years. President Trump got to appoint five new judges um, and uh, granted mostly all of them four out of five were Republican appointees who were replaced. But um, how? different is the court now? Do you see it different at all? Uh, do you adjust your strategy based on uh, these new five appointees? All right, Evan. I don't know that the court is dramatically different. As you say, the new judges, uh, who are some very fine people, a number of whom I've known for, for many years, almost as long as I've known Steve, uh, <laughs> they're in, in most instances replacing judges who have taken senior status or left the court who largely saw the law similarly to how they saw it. Now, on, on the other hand, these are some you know, very active, energetic, uh, very conservative or libertarian judges who, if they form a panel, it may be a very different panel than you might have gotten before that. And then the last thing I'd say is that several of these seats had been open for quite a while, and so it isn't as, as, as though it's a complete uh, shift even of the, the, the seats that had been uh, filled by President Trump. It's adding to an existing court, which is doing a fine job of managing its very heavy uh, docket. I'm sure that the other judges are happy now to be able to divide that workload with their new colleagues, but with such a large court with as many active and uh, senior judges as it has, my guess is that you're not going to see dramatic uh, swings in its jurisprudence until perhaps we see some on banc votes that otherwise might have been either tied up or uh, uh, where, where might you might see a, a nine to eight vote where you previously might have seen a, an eight to seven vote. Yeah, I mean, I, I, would just, it's, I would just add that I think the Evans' last point is the important one, which is that a bunch of these seats had been open for a while. I mean, President Trump has already um, successfully confirmed five nominees to the Fifth Circuit. 
Um, in eight years, President Obama got three. Um, and that was not because the seats weren't there to be filled. It was because uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee followed the blue slip policy um, and senators from Texas and Louisiana, well, to Texas and Mississippi, not Louisiana, um, wouldn't return their blue slips. Um, I, the reason why that matters is it's just a math problem, right? That um, of the 17 active judges on the Fifth Circuit today, um, if my math is right, five of them were appointed by Democratic presidents. Um, if you take out the five Trump nominees, um, that's five out of 12 as opposed to five out of 17. So the odds of a um, outlier panel, I might say, um, and the odds that you actually might have um, some chance of an en banc split along ideological lines where the, the median vote is closer to the Democratic appointee I think have gone down dramatically um, just because of the numbers. All right. Um, Jane? Uh, let me make one. Um, uh, uh, unlike these three folks who, who work in a, in a rarefied um, strata of, of the law of Supreme Court practitioners, the Solicitor General, academia, and, and, uh, and a, a constitutional practice, I'm a regular Joe lawyer who handles regular cases. That's why she appeared in front of the Supreme Court. For, yes. for, for some individual clients who, who I happen to handle it from the trial court. But um, for, for people like me who have meat and potatoes litigation that comes through the federal courts and then winds up in the uh, in the Fifth Circuit, the, um, the the kind of the procedural practice of the identity of your panel members remaining a state secret until the eve of argument means that you can't um, focus your brief in a particular way aimed toward a particular uh, set of judges because your panel is going to be your panel and 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 on the math issue I agree with with Professor Vladek uh, that you know it's five out of how many but um, you can't do that at the briefing stage if you don't know who your panel members are and once your briefs are in the 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 nuances of how do you make your oral argument different once you learn the identity of the panel members? There's really only so much you can do at that point, and I, I don't. I haven't argued in any other circuits, so I don't know if other circuits have the same thing, the same mystery um, uh, of not letting. Fourth you know. circuit, you find out the morning of argument. That's what Dang. I can. Yeah. Se seventh as well. DC circuit, you find out I think 45 days in advance, so, so it runs some again. extremes. Yeah. yeah. Interesting, and that's a perfect transition into my next question, which is: Is Fifth Circuit, and that's kind of more of a practical question, what should people who file in the Fifth Circuit be um, aware of in terms of their special practice. For example, in DC Circuit, you have to put asterisks in front of a case that you're chiefly relying on, right? So is there something like that in the Fifth Circuit, or are there judges in the Fifth Circuit that are very particular about certain things? The, um, the Fifth Circuit clerk's office is super duper duper competent and super particular about formatting issues. They will strike your brief. They will strike your record excerpts in a, an instant for um, things that, that technically violate procedures but seem ridiculous. For example, if in your statement of facts you, um, you have a citation to a page in the record on appeal and you have to use a format that's ROA dot and then the page number, but it's awesome because the court can then they have software in the, high, in the uh, electronic brief, they just click on that and it automatically takes them to that page in the electronic record. So if, if you've got two monitors up, you're reading your brief, you click on that, it takes you to the page of testimony or the page in the affidavit or the pleading or the order or whatever it is. So, so it's great to use that. But if you, let's say you're citing to a page of testimony and you say, Mr. Smith said X, ROA.123. He also said um, B. Id. He all, then went on to say whatever, id. They will strike it because you can't have id in the statement of facts, even though it's referencing the record on appeal site that was one sentence before. So they'll strike you for things like that, but they are, um, if you need that, to have your oral argument, this happened to me, I needed them to move my oral argument because of timing of one of my kids' uh, a school function and they will bend over backwards for you. They will not move an oral argument setting because I have an argument in a, 
you know, the Supreme Court of Texas the day before, sorry, get on a late plane. They will not move it for an argument or an appearance in another court, but they will move it in a minute because it's my kid's birthday or my wedding anniversary or something like that. So there, um, there's a humanity uh, attached to the, the way the, the clerk's office operates. There are still folks there from when I was a law clerk in the, in the 89, 90 term, and when I go in to check in for argument in the first week of November, I'm gonna go in there and Geraldine's gonna be sitting there and she'll say, Jane, how are you doing? Good to see you, Gerilyn. And she'll, we'll have a little moment, we'll, re, we'll remember Judge Garza. And we've been doing that since 1989. And, and so the, the, uh, the, the personality of the court um, is, is significant. Kyle? Yeah, I, I don't have much to add to that. The clerk's office is uh, at all times professional. They're an incredible resource. I guess the one thing that I'm struck by in practicing in the Fifth Circuit is the quality of the judge's preparation for oral argument. Every case that I've argued in the Fifth Circuit, I found the panel to be without exception exceedingly well prepared, and that has not always been to my benefit. Uh, but for the most part, uh, for the most part, it's been a good opportunity to engage in a dialogue on the case. I don't know the extent to which that's true in other circuits, but I would tell any practitioner in the Fifth Circuit to, uh, to go in uh, knowing that the judges will get into the weeds, they will get into the minutia, and they might know your case better than, in fact, you do. So since judges really know their stuff, let's see if you guys know your stuff. I have a couple of trivia questions involving identifying judges. So um, if uh, n panelists don't know, then I will open it to the audience. Um, let's start with a really easy one. This Fifth Circuit judge played drums at bars and clubs around Dallas. Judge Willett. A point for you. <laughs> no one right. told me there was going to be a quiz. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pop quiz. I bet you know all about it as a professor. <laughs> um, let's say, OK, second question. This Fifth Circuit judge spent two years teaching for America in rural Mississippi. Judge Costa. Very good. All right, very knowledgeable panelists. Question number three. Um, which judge currently on the Fifth Circuit loves to ride horses and... Elizabeth? Judge Owen. Judge Owen. Very good. She also has a, does bring her dogs to the office sometimes. That was my other part. <laughs> and uh, one more question. This, and Kyle, you can't answer it. <laughs> Pressure's off. Which Wait. judge... <laughs> I'm guessing Judge Oldham. No? Oh, well, I was thinking, you know, <laughs> minus one. He knows. <laughs> <laughs> Which judge learned English by watching Sesame Street? Evan? Judge Ho. There you go. Well done. <laughs> and final question. This Fifth Circuit judge killed a coyote in self-defense using his concealed handgun while out jogging. That's a trick question. I thought the governor did that. The governor did that. As yes, far as I know, yes, he's not, yes, yes, he's not yes. a Fifth Circuit appointee. I was just trying to lighten it okay. up. <laughs> There's a vacancy, right? <laughs> yeah, right? Because now we're going to get into the weeds of uh, the Fifth Circuit cases. So uh, laughter is over. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Aww. Uh, and get it all out now. <laughs> The first case on the agenda is the most recent iteration of Hernandez versus Mesa. And uh, Steve Vladek is going to introduce the case, tell us briefly about the facts and the procedure history and the holding. Uh, Steve has a spe very uh, special uh, attachment to the case since he wrote the uh, cert petition uh, asking the Supreme Court to take it up. True story. Um, OK, so um, Hernandez versus Mesa, I should say, um, as Anya mentioned, uh, I'm co-counsel to the petitioners. Um, what I'm about to say is just my views and not necessarily those of the, petition of the petitioners or their, their lawyers, um, and also I'm, I'm biased. Um, so I think a lot of what you're going to hear uh, this afternoon is about how in some of its recent decisions the Fifth Circuit has gotten things right, uh, and I think I'm here to explain why I think in some of its recent decisions it's gotten things wrong. Um, and Hernandez versus Mesa is a good example. So Hernandez versus Mesa, um, if you don't know it, is a case arising out of a cross-border shooting 
um, in 2010 by a Customs and Border Patrol agent of an unarmed 15-year-old Mexican national um, who was shot and killed while playing with friends in the culvert that is sort of where the Rio Grande used to be um, between El Paso and Juarez. Um, there are some dispute about exactly whether the shooting was provoked or not, but the case is currently and remains in a posture of a motion to dismiss. So we assume the allegations as pled in the well-pleaded complaint, um, and the allegations are that it was unprovoked, um, that Agent Mesa used deadly force, um, and that he therefore violated uh, Sergio Hernandez's Fourth and Fifth Amendment rights. Um, his parents <coughs> sued Agent Mesa um, for damages um, under a doctrine called Bivens. Bivens is a 1971 Supreme Court decision in which the Supreme Court um, recognized that there are circumstances in which federal officers can be sued for damages directly under the Constitution, even though Congress has never seen fit to provide an express cause of action in such cases. Um, and the case, uh, basically, the district court basically threw the case out. Um, the Fifth Circuit, after a panel divided badly um, the first time around um, on whether there was a Bivens remedy and whether a Mexican national standing on Mexican soil even has Fourth and Fifth Amendment rights, um, went on bonk in, I think, what we can all call Hernandez 1, um, and unanimously held that whatever cause of action might exist and whatever the merits might be, Agent Mesa was entitled to qualified immunity. Um, because it wasn't clear at the time of the shooting that a 15-year-old Mexican national standing in the culvert um, had the constitutional rights that the parents were, were claiming. Um, the Supreme Court granted cert and reversed, um, or I should say technically vacated, that analysis um, in Hernandez versus Mesa, Hernandez 1, in 2017. Um, and what the court said in Hernandez 1 um, is that qualified immunity is based upon the facts available to the officer at the time of his conduct. Um, and at the time of Agent Mesa's shooting, he didn't know who he was shooting at. And so therefore, he didn't know that Hernandez was a Mexican national with no substantial voluntary connection to the United States. He didn't know that the person he was shooting at might not have clearly established constitutional rights. Um, this doctrine actually usually works out in the officer's favor, um, right? That assessing qualified immunity based on the facts known to the officer usually means if the officer thinks it's a gun and it really is a, you know, a hot dog, um, we still forgive him his reasonable mistake. Um, in this context, it cut the other way. So the court uh, uh, vacated the Fifth Circuit's qualified immunity analysis and sent it back and said, oh, but we've just decided in this other case, Ziglar versus Abbasi, um, that courts should be even more skeptical of providing these Bivens remedies um, than they have been in the past. And so Fifth Circuit on remand, instead of trying to reach the messy merits, you should first decide what, how, if it, how, if at all, Abbasi affects the case. So the case went back to the Fifth Circuit. Um, the Fifth Circuit decided to hear it uh, as an initial matter on remand on Bonk, um, and taking the Supreme Court's cue um, held by a 12 to 2 vote um, that there is no Bivens remedy, um, that the federal courts should not recognize damages claims on facts like these. Um, and even though Abbasi had been at pains to distinguish that case, which was a challenge to high-level policy decisions made by senior government officials after 9-11 from cases of what Justice Kennedy called ordinary law enforcement overreach. Um, the Fifth Circuit said that distinction really doesn't hold up. Um, and in fact, um, we shouldn't apply Bivens in any new context. Um, and a new context is any circumstance in which we haven't previously applied Bivens. There's never been a Bivens case for a cross-border shooting before. So therefore, no Bivens now. Um, Never mind um, that that leaves the Hernandez family with no remedy whatsoever, right? So unlike in Abbasi, there's no other possible legal mechanism for them to obtain redress for the alleged constitutional violations by Agent Mesa. Um, we filed the cert petition. Um, we basically framed the cert petition as um, this, you know, the Fifth Circuit on remand collapsed the distinction that Abbasi had repeatedly drawn. Um, which is between challenges to high-level senior official conduct in the national security space and ordinary law enforcement overreach, um, and that this case really is just an ordinary law enforcement overreach case in a unique factual setting. Um, we filed the cert petition on June 15th. Um, two weeks later, Justice Kennedy, um, who wrote the majority opinion in Abbasi, announced he was retiring. Um, that was a bit of a surprise. Um, and I think it changed the optics of our petition a little bit, um, right, that, you know, I think had you asked me um, at the time we filed the petition what our chance was, I would have said only if Justice Kennedy wants to reiterate what he said in Abbasi. Um, and so I would have thought that we were dead in the water at that point. Um, 
Then uh, the day after the uh, Agent Mesa's brief in opposition came in, um, the Ninth Circuit did us a solid um, and decided in a case with eerily similar facts called Rodriguez versus Swartz, a cross-border shooting in Arizona, um, that there actually should be a Bivens remedy um, and no qualified immunity um, and the case should go forward. Um, so there's now a dead-on circuit split between the Fifth Circuit en banc majority's analysis in Hernandez II um, and the Ninth Circuit's holding in Rodriguez. Um, rather than asking the Ninth Circuit to go en banc, uh, the officer defendant in that case um, has gone directly to the Supreme Court. So there are now pending cert petitions in both cases. Um, on October 1st, the Supreme Court uh, asked the Solicitor General to weigh in in Hernandez. Um, I, you know, my, my, my colleagues to my right and left may have views on this. My, I read that not as a classic CBSG, which is, should we take this case at all? Um, I read that as a, dear government, tell us how to take these cases. Um, right? That we're going to resolve the circuit split one way or the other. Should we take both? Should we take one? You know, give, us, give us a clue. Um, CBSG briefs have no uh, formal deadline, so this will all, I think, now get held up until the government files its brief, maybe December, maybe January. Um, and then you know, to be de decided whether the court's going to take it February or March. So um, that was a very technical version. Just to, to not lose sight of the forest for the trees, the real issue at the bottom of this case is not just um, whether there's a remedy for this uh, allegedly unprovoked cross-border shooting. The real issue is, um, is it really the case that when the allegation in the complaint is that a federal law enforcement officer has violated clearly established constitutional rights, for which there is no other possible remedy, because that's the way the case is structured. Is it really the case that the federal courts lack the ability and lack the power to provide damages um, and to thereby provide no mechanism for enforcing the Constitution? And this case also kind of really ha zooms in on two extremely important issues that are highly controversial. Uh, one is the Bivens Doctrine that Steve kind of uh, explained about the cause of action uh, against federal agents. And another one is qualified immunity. So what's interesting about the doctrine of qualified immunity is that it seems that it's, um, the opposition to it uh, seems to be coming from both sides now, from the left and the right. For example, Justice Willett wrote a concurrence in uh, Zade versus Robinson, a case involving administrative warrantless search, where he came on the record saying, by the way, I think that the doctrine of qualified immunity at the very least needs to be uh, reformed and there at least should be a finding of constitutional violation before you go into the second part of the test of whether something is clearly established. So um, Kyle, Evan, uh, would you like to weigh in on the doctrine of qualified immunity? Uh, well, as a, as a lawyer for the state of Texas, I love qualified immunity. Uh, it shouldn't be revisited at all. It's working great. Uh, I say that in sort of a tongue-in-cheek way. Um, as, as Anya pointed out, uh, there have been a, a few jurists who have pointed out uh, their reservations with the doctrine of qualified immunity, and they've asked the question, should we be shielding law enforcement officers who violate the constitutional rights of citizens uh, when it's not actually clear that there was a constitutional violation. Uh, in addition to Judge Willett's concurrence that uh, Anya pointed out, Justice Thomas uh, has written on that very issue as well. Uh, so it's clear that uh, several judges on the right are thinking about qualified immunity, uh, whether it should be rethought, whether it should be re-theorized, and whether it should be scaled back. Uh, as a lawyer for the state, uh, this is one of the issues that I'm watching uh, the most closely in the years ahead. There was a cert petition that uh, teed up uh, recently uh, whether... Allah versus Milling? Excuse me? Allah versus Milling? Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Whether uh, the doctrine should be revisited. Uh, that case went away. I believe it was settled out, yes. if I'm recalling correctly. Yeah, the uh, state of Connecticut settled. The state of Connecticut settled. Uh, but I think the issue is likely to arise again at the Supreme Court sometime soon. Can I say, just, just to be clear though, I mean, I, I don't want to lose the thread. The, the, the Hernandez case, Anya's right that at various points qualified immunity has been part of the case. Um, it's actually not part of what's currently before the Supreme Court, right? right. So, so the Supreme Court's being asked, assuming there is no qualified immunity, um, which is the implication of what the Supreme Court held in Hernandez 1, um, is it still the case? So no qualified immunity means the officer violated clearly established constitutional rights of which a reasonable person should have known. Is it still the case, assuming that, and again, we're still at the motion to dismiss stage, 
um, that on those facts, federal courts can't provide a remedy. Although and I think Judge a, Dennis did concur and talked about qualified immunity and said that I don't know what we're doing here talking about Bivens. But you're right that it is going uh, to the U.S. Supreme Court on the question of Bivens, which is a perfect transition to a question to Evan. Uh, so what do you think uh, about Bivens? And, you know, uh, generally speaking, folks talk about it, it, it in the, as it's a judge-made law from the 1970s, right? But there, there's been some research lately, for example, Jim Fander from the Northwestern, who, um, and that research points to common law causes of action, you know, where you actually could sue federal agents for violating someone's individual rights, um, and, and, and you could actually get remedy. I mean, Bivens itself started off with the government saying, well, we, we're not saying that you can't bring any lawsuits. It's just that if you can strip this guy of his authority by saying he acted unlawfully, you go into New York, use a New York cause of action, treat him as if he were you know, just some other random person that decided to barge into Bivens's apartment and subject him to all of these uh, 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 indignities. And what the Supreme Court, I think, said is that is a regime that is so woefully inadequate in so many ways because it treats people vastly different across the United States based upon the vagaries of state law, the unusual nature of the immunities that are perhaps available uh, in one state versus another when we're theoretically talking about the violation of federal rights, which ought the court said, to be uniform across the country, and in which, frankly, we're, we're not willing to indulge the fiction that someone with a badge clothed with the authority of the, you know, what was it then, what do they call it before the, the six unknown? Six unknown named agents of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. Federal Bureau of Narcotics, that that person is not really similarly situated to some random guy just bursting into your apartment, right? The reason I think that you know, the discussion that was just had about where qualified immunity might fit into all of this is that the Supreme Court, whether it regards Bivens and its progeny as just purely judge-made or as you know, some emanation of a common law tradition or some other way to protect rights that isn't clearly provided in either the Constitution and certainly not in any statute. Why qualified immunity, I think, is an important thing to keep in mind, even if you're only focused on whether or not there is a Bivens action to be had, is the Supreme Court is looking at all of this as a great, big, huge, massive engine. And if it opens the spigot too much of liability, then it is going to have a, it seems historically to have thought there's a massive problem uh, with expanding the number of causes of action. On the other hand, if you have a really limited number of causes of action, things that are truly clearly established for specific kinds of constitutional rights that are especially important, well then maybe qualified immunity is not quite as important because we have uh, a much lesser range of, of potential uh, disruption to the federal government doing its work. Same thing, of course, is true in Section 1983 for state and, and local governments. There are competing values that the court is trying to superintend, and the real question is, is that a judicial enterprise? Is it something really in which courts are the best equipped to be able to manage those many competing policy concerns? It's the world that we've got, right? At least with Section 1983, you have a statute there in Congress writing in the, 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 the you know, era right after the Civil War and seeing genuine atrocities being committed against the recently freed population in the South seem to expansively grant the federal courts uh, a massive authority to be able to protect federal rights. With respect to Bivens, that's, that's, that's less clear. Congress could superintend that by taking action at any given time, and I think that the Supreme Court's hesitation on the expansion of the liability front is tied to that, but that then may, maybe suggests that the court could say, well, uh, 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 Let's let's impose limits on uh, our own al already limited version of immunity, thereby uh, per permitting exploration of those fundamental rights. That I'm not sure how will play out in Steve's case. It will be very interesting. I'm I'm excited to see. 
And how about uh, Steve's argument, Jane and Kyle, that's to you, about the Westfall Act and basically saying that if you do essentially gut Bivens, right, then the Westfall Act violates um, uh, due process because essentially there is no um, remedy at all for these individuals. Um, well, uh, I'm, I'm going to, I guess, uh, do the thing that people should never do an oral argument and answer a slightly different question. <laughs> uh, because because I wanted to, to make a point about Judge Prado's dissenting opinion. Um, this is the timing of this uh, that came out, I guess, in March. And so this would be among the very last opinions that Judge Prado would have written before he left the court to go and be uh, ambassador to Argentina. Um, and he takes this moment to, um, to say this is exactly what Bivens is meant for and the court is getting distracted by magic words. There's an ooga booga look at this factor um, that the court in conducting its analysis, it, he says is, is led astray by by empty labels of national security, foreign affairs, and extraterritoriality. These labels, as we say in Texas, are all hat, no cattle. And, and that's a, um, uh, a, uh, a circumstance, I think we saw a lot of that immediately post 9-11, of, oh, it's national security. We've got to do all oh, national security. Oh, yeah, it's extraterritoriality. He was over there. Oh, no, can't be Bivens. Oh, extraterritoriality. And the, the um, uh, the the notion that that you can uh, hang these labels and and that will be enough um, to determine substantive rights um, is is a is a a bit disturbing um, and it's uh, a, a dis, it's a bit disappointing because I think you can. Um, you know, reasonable minds, I guess, could differ, and you could arrive at the same point through a different analysis, but the but sort of knee-jerk use of, of notions of, oh, it's national security, it's extraterritoriality, so we must treat it differently. Well, that's, uh, um, it, it, it thins out and dilutes uh, sort of a, a, a meaning, more meaningful analysis of the issues. Uh, and also as a slightly more, on a personal aside, um, my husband was a law clerk for Judge Prado back when he was on the district bench um, in the, on the way back when, so he's sort of my judge-in-law. <laughs> Evan, I saw you raise hand. Did you want to respond to Jane? No, no, no. Okay, no. how about Kyle? Kyle, you wanted to say something. Oh, no, I, I, I'm just going to say that I'm, your question is a very important one, and it's one on which I'm going to punt, because that's the type of thing that the state of Texas could conceivably weigh in on from an amicus posture. So I'll say to the listeners at home and the folks in this room, stay tuned. The state of Texas might have something to say about that, should this case be granted. Something tells me not on my side. <laughs> and that was Steve. Uh, uh, now let's uh, discuss uh, the second opinion on the agenda, whole women's health, and Evan, uh, you're going to tee it up for us. Yes, you know, I, I can't imagine why you selected this case. Uh, it, it, it involves abortion, religious liberty, uh, what is it that the, the major thing? Interlocutory appellate jurisdiction. Yes, that's it. It's Come the collateral on. order doctrine, I think, that you wanted to talk about. Well, so to technically, interestingly enough, although this is under, abortion underlies this question, this is the statute, SB 8, in which the Texas legislature requires that fetal remains be given either a cremation or a burial rather than be uh, discarded uh, with, with ordinary medical waste. And it, it has a long history, starting with administrative uh, regulatory uh, uh, attempts by the state to impose this by regulation. The legislature stepped in after Judge Sparks invalidated that and passed this law. And that's what's at issue right now. Uh, this particular decision, however, doesn't turn either on abortion or really on religious liberty, although that's the fundamental uh, driver of what's happening, but on Rule 45D of the Federal Rules of Evidence, which sounds so much less interesting, really. Uh, but underlying most important cases, there is some procedural or, or collateral issue that's driving what the court is doing, even if it's motivated by something that's, that's much sexier than discovery limits. And in this particular case, we had a panel made up of Judge Jones. We've talked about her. Judge Ho, my, uh, he clerked for Justice Thomas, the same term I clerked for, excuse me, clerked for Justice Scalia. Uh, and then Judge Costa, who was, you know, uh, so, so at least two of the three were answers to your trivia questions. Uh, they saw the world diametrically differently 
this is an example of, of how the Fifth Circuit, still with its varied membership, can approach the same set of facts and see things uh, with vastly different eyes. And everything that Judge Jones, who wrote the majority opinion, and Judge Ho thought about all the fundamental issues, Judge Costa said, what are you talking about? This is not important at all. These aren't significant. They might not even be preserved. Uh, and, and so you had a fundamental divide, uh, perhaps ships crossing in the night, or at least not purporting to sail along the, the same path here. Uh, this particular issue involved a non-party. The Texas Catholic Conference of Bishops is the, the party that we're referring to, and they uh, had as their executive director a woman who had been involved in the discussions about whether or not the state should require that fetal remains be uh, uh, buried or cremated as opposed to treated like medical waste. And she was going to be a, a third party witness. And what led to the dispute that led to this unusual interlocutory opinion with extremely heated language that was released literally the day before a trial began. I remember I was I had just arrived with my wife in Washington, D.C. We were checking into our new apartment. And I looked at my phone and I got the, the opinions. The Fifth Circuit will send out emails. We've released the following opinions today. So I happened to click on it and thought, wow, I need to sit down and read this. Uh, this, this is a, a little more interesting maybe than you know, a, an unpublished opinion about a commercial dispute. And the reason that it happened that way was because in the uh, proceedings before Judge Ezra, the senior judge from the District of Hawaii, who has given up his retirement to come to Texas and help the Southern, uh, the Western District of Texas uh, decrease its backlog and was assigned this this case, he had set the, the trial, a bench trial, about the validity of SB 8 for July 16th, having preliminarily enjoined it back in January. And he assigned to Judge Andy Austin, a magistrate judge here in Austin, the responsibility for overseeing the discovery in March. And this is an important timing. And uh, you'll see the majority thought that the timing of many of the things I'm about to describe was actually significant to how the issue should be resolved. In March, I, I, I think the, the court says this was uh, uh, on the eve of, uh, uh, on March 21st, 2018, the eve of Holy Week for Christians, a period of intense religious devotional activity, the plaintiffs served the bishop with a third party subpoena. So you can see the way that Judge Jones characterize that as foreshadowing how we're going to re resolve this. You don't add in all of those important details if you don't think that the religious nature of what's happening is significant. They asked for an extremely broad set of documents, uh, anything that anyone within the Conference of Bishops had that related to correspondence with any member of the legislature, the Texas Attorney General staff, et cetera, et cetera, any document that you know involved ab abortion in any way, which is quite a lot of things one would imagine for a Catholic bishops conference. Uh, and it had a short fuse, and this is how she put it. The return date of the subpoena was 9 a.m. on the Tuesday following Easter Sunday. So adding that in is suggesting we're basically uh, uh, waiting until March to serve the Catholic bishops with this really broad discovery order, and we want it to be done very quickly and right after the end of Holy Week. And so the bishops filed a, a motion to quash, which for some procedural re reasons was not addressed immediately, and the... Uh, uh, plaintiffs, whole woman's is the, the plaintiff has in the U.S. Supreme Court case of a similar name, uh, they agreed to some search terms, which still generated thousands and thousands and thousands of documents, many of which the bishops provided, said, okay, here you go, but held back a number as privileged. And that's ultimately what this lawsuit is about. They gave them over to the magistrate judge on a very tight fuse. Uh, he, he gave them a couple of days to file a renewed motion to quash and then rejected their arguments. Judge Ezra Suasponte took the 14-day period that would ordinarily be available for an appeal and reduced that to one day for them to be able to file it. He then ruled they filed the, their appeal, I think, on a, on a Wednesday or a, thur a, Thursday and, a Thursday, and then he ruled on Sunday which Judge Ho pointed out was Father's Day, and Judge Jones said is when all the people involved would be in church because this is a Christian organization, and said you have 24 hours to comply. That then led to this emergency appeal, and as Professor Vladek mentioned, one of the initial questions is, what possible basis would the Fifth Circuit have to intervene in a discovery dispute, uh, even one in a case that's as interesting and important as this one, because discovery is classically something that's interlocutory and not a proper basis for uh, an inter 
interlocutory appeal. And the, and the, the Fifth Circuit said, well, we think it's, it's okay under the collateral order doctrine, which requires that we have a conclusive judgment. It's conclusive as to this non-party. They're not a party. They don't get to appeal in any other way. Uh, it's about a substantial and important question uh, that, that's aside from the the, the, the merits of it, and otherwise it would never be able to be litigated and Evan, at all. And Evan, could I interrupt you for a second here? But how about then the relief of mandamus, right? That's something that Judge Costa brings up, saying that, no, you didn't only have to do it. That's because. the first and important locus of, of difference between the majority and Judge Costa. He says, mandamus is always available when a, a, you have a clear entitlement to relief and are severely burdened by this. But of course, the standard of review for mandamus is so fundamentally different. You have to have a clear entitlement to a right. And here we don't have case law that really goes into this exact circumstance. And certainly we do have a lot of case law that suggests that discovery disputes are not uh, 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 the sorts of things that courts are going to overturn on, on even in a mandamus uh, basis, although right now the Supreme Court of the United States just last night issued another stay of an extraordinary uh, 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 discovery request, this uh, deposition of the Secretary of Commerce. So we're seeing more of this, I think, happen. Mandamus would have almost certainly doomed the appellate review, or very likely would have. The collateral order doctrine allowing an appeal made it much easier for the Fifth Circuit to evaluate the questions uh, on, on a more traditional uh, appellate slate. Steve, looks like you, you, you're burning to uh, no, I'm jump just saying, in I mean, here. I think part of why mandamus would have doomed the appeal is because um, the majority doesn't end up actually holding that the discovery order violated the First Amendment, right? It, hold, it holds only that the discovery order was inconsistent with RIFRA and the federal rules of, uh, and, and federal procedural rules. Well, it doesn't even say it was inconsistent with RIFRA, right. right? There's a lot of discussions, a very interesting opinion that's worth reading. There's a lot of discussion of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, RIFRA. There's the a lot of discussion. Procedural. The actual holding is simply this. It was an abuse of discretion under Rule 45D of the Federal Rules of Evidence not to quash the subpoena. But all of that First Amendment analysis, all of the analysis of RIFTA is what the court used to say, we have the doctrine of constitutional avoidance. I see a number of my former students in the class, and we talked about the doctrine of constitutional avoidance a number of times. And here's an application in which the Fifth Circuit says, these are serious questions. This is, again, the, the, the most important difference between the panel majority and the dissent, between the panel majority and the district court and the magistrate judge is, the panel majority says, these are really important religious liberty questions. Religious Freedom Restoration Act questions, free exercise questions, establishment clause questions, freedom of association and petition clause questions. All of which suggest that by forcing a religious organization like the bishops of the Catholic Church in the state of Texas to turn over their internal deliberations, we are threatening to undermine those very important rights. Now, the court does not go in and actually resolve those questions, but makes pretty clear that it thinks that the bishops have the better of the argument. Expressly says many times, we don't decide them. But the doctrine of constitutional avoidance says that if you have two ways of resolving a dispute, one of which allows us to set aside serious constitutional questions and we can resolve it in an alternative way, we should do that. Because those serious issues could be avoided by quashing the subpoena and the regular 45D analysis, the court said, the majority at least said, uh, uh, amply supported that basis, that's the path the district court should have done. And it's so essential to understand the reason the district court and Judge Costa didn't want to go down that path is they didn't think that the constitutional questions were that substantial. It isn't that you can throw out some constitutional question and avoid it by going down a different path. It has to be a serious and substantial one. And here, if you look at the opinion of the, the majority and Judge Ho's concurring opinion, Judge Ho's concurring opinion, let me just read very quickly. It's one page, I yes, promise. Yes, and be... I actually have a question about that concurring opinion, okay, well, opinion before we move on to the next case. Yeah, Judge Ho's concurring opinion, one page, and he starts off by saying this. It is hard to imagine a better example of how far we have strayed from the text and original understanding of the Constitution than this case. Out of all the cases out there, this is the one, he says, that shows that the courts have gone so far away from the text and original understanding of the Constitution. Judge Costa says, this is an ordinary case. We have unpreserved or waived constitutional questions that aren't even that important because the bishops gave the documents to the judge to look at if they thought they were so fundamentally important that judges could not look around and see what we're doing, don't give them the judge. Bring an emergency stay motion to us. So that is gone and forfeited. And Judge Ho and Judge Jones see this as something so different 
uh, of a constitutional significance, that leads to this massive departure, one person saying this is an ordinary discovery dispute, we can't disturb the district court's finding, and the other two essentially saying that the district judge has acted with either malice or at least great insensitivity towards religious liberty in this country. That's a stark divide on a court that is not regarded as one of the most divided courts in this country. Absolutely, and uh, in terms of Justice Judge Ho's opinion, uh, essentially one day before trial, right, that's when uh, the opinion is issued. He says, nothing in the text or original understanding of the Constitution Constitution prevents a state from requiring the proper burial of fetal remains. So he's weighing in on the merits of the issues to go on before trial the next day. How unusual is it for an appellate court to actually do something like that? It's fair, it's, it's, it's fairly unusual, I think, for an appellate court to do it, but less unusual for a concurring opinion to do that. Would you guys agree when you see a concurring opinion dissenting from the denial of rehearing, dissenting from the denial of certiorari at the Supreme Court stage? Certiorari is about whether we're going to take the case. We dissent from the denial frequently, not just to say, oh, no, we really ought to have resolved the circuit split, but because we think that the outcome is so clear and so important that we cannot let this decision stand. I don't know that Judge Ho really intended to resolve the merits so much as just to say, on the one hand, we have a pretty weak case against the state being able to impose this sort of regulation, you know, take that for, for what it is. On the other hand, we have this overburden of religious exercise, which the Constitution clearly protects. I think that that was what he was trying to say is that when we're weighing these interests, one, in his opinion, weighed much stronger than the other, making it strange that the court even had to entertain this question at all. That was his perspective. I would like to circle back to something that, that Evan said, and uh, I agree it is a, it's a startling thing to see the, um, the divide within the panel on something that ought never to be the subject, or very rarely, and yet is now so common, uh, the subject of, a, of an appellate court opinion, and that is um, whether or not the district court is the enemy. What the, the ad hominem um, slights and attacks that you see so often with, with uh, really almost no hesitation. It just in, in the four cases that were selected for us to discuss today, two of them have huge chunks, some in the majority, some in concurrences, of, of um, pure ad hominem attacks. The district court is a, is a bad guy. This lawyer is a bad guy. This person's a bad guy. And the, um, the, the notion that, that an Article III judge is making a discovery decision based on on some sort of malice, um, as is really fairly strongly implied in the uh, in the, the majority opinion, is um, is something that's that uh, I find you know depressing. The the you know the the common phrase is judges we call balls and strikes we call balls and strikes well we all know that's that's trite that's not true that's ridiculous but if that's true you say that's a ball or that's a strike you don't say hey dumbass pitcher what are you doing you threw that over there on purpose no you say that was a ball um, and and what we have here the the um, the Judge Costa found it so sufficiently troubling that a whole se section of his dissenting opinion discusses what he describes as the troubling pot shots directed at the district court um, by the majority and the concurrence piling on. And, and I strongly uh, recommend that, that all of us view that and take it to heart. And it, it ought not matter whether your you agree substantively with where the majority arrived or where the dissent arrived, but Article III judges throwing stones at other Article III judges is, uh, is unseemly, it's unprofessional, it's inappropriate, and, and it, you know, it, it makes me sad to see in the circuit I love. Okay, we only have time for one more opinion to discuss. We barely have any time, but Steve, do you want to just, weigh just in really I mean, quickly? I, I think if you haven't read Justice Gorsuch's opinion, um, partially concurring in and partially dissenting from the stay application in the commerce census dispute from last night, um, you should. 
And then you should read the first five pages of the plaintiff's opposition to the government's request for a stay and look at the two very different worlds that those opinions are describing. Um, I think we're in for more of this, right? Because I think one of the things that we're seeing, and I don't know how much of it is ideological and how much of it is actually more a result that with the demise of the blue slip policy and with the demise of the filibuster, you're seeing judges who are further to the extremes. But one of the, I think, structural conflicts we're going to see in the next 10, 15 years is appellate courts castigating and criticizing district courts for matters that we had traditionally thought were generally in the district court's discretion. Um, we've seen that a couple, I mean, the, the, the Solicitor General during the Trump administration has asked the Supreme Court for mandamus relief directly against district courts more than the last five administrations combined in two years, um, right? And so I think this is a trend, and I'm afraid that Jane is not only right but that is actually, you know, we're likely to see more of this going forward, I think, not less. Speaking I just want to add of, one, yes, one more yes, thing Anna. on that, just because I'm not sure I, I, I agree with the, the conclusion that Jane mentioned, that we should obviously have deep respect for each other, whether as lawyers or as judges. I do think that when I went back and read the majority opinion, I didn't take quite as much of his pot shots at the district court as Judge Costa suggests. I think really what it was is that Judge Jones, while, while traditionally acting as, you know, Judge Jones is a very fierce and energetic and powerful writer with strong, strong views. She really, I think, thought this is so basic that we treat religious organizations with much deeper respect than the district court did. And in emphasizing how this should be something that is so clear under the law, people can disagree about that. As you said, you can have different views on all of these issues, that the message she was trying to signal was, District judges out there do not get anywhere close to what happened here. Now, that may or may not be characterized as a pot shot. I thought, as I went back, that it was less of pot shotting and more of a firm and vigorous determination to signal what she thought the law was. But uh, at, at the very least, the fact that the panel saw it so differently is a, is a message that, as Steve says, we may be in for a rocky ride in a lot of ways. And that's a perfect transition to the municipal liability slash Brady case that <laughs> Jane is going to talk about. Um, Alvarez versus the city of Brownsville. Alvarez versus the city of Brownsville uh, is an en banc uh, decision by the court that arises out of a section 1983 um, claim out of Brownsville, Texas, my hometown. Uh, there was a, uh, a fellow named Alvarez who is described in the opinion as a 17-year-old ninth grade special education student. Uh, he was arrested by the Brownsville Police Department. Um, he was being loud and mouthy, and so some, some police officers in the police station were moving him from a regular cell into a padded cell. During the, the transition, uh, there was a scuffle between um, Mr. Alvarez and a police officer, and uh, ultimately uh, off, uh, with an officer named Arias, and ultimately uh, Alvarez was handcuffed and, and leg uh, shackles, and they got him into the padded cell. At that point, there were two investigations that happened. One was an internal affairs investigation to determine whether the officer had acted appropriately or had used excessive force, followed procedures during the scuffle in getting Mr. Alvarez into the padded cell. And as part of that internal affairs investigation, they downloaded the, there were surveillance cameras and there were four videos from in this, this view, that view, that view, that view. And so the internal affairs fella downloaded those, looked at those, did the internal affairs analysis, determined that Officer Arias acted totally within procedures, and then put the uh, videos in a file. Meanwhile, there was a criminal investigation to determine whether or not Mr. Alvarez ought to be charged criminally with assaulting a police officer. And so the criminal division, um, they took a statement from the various officers who were there, the eyewitnesses, including Officer Arias, who said, oh yeah, he grabbed me here, he bit me, he did this, he did that. They charged Mr. Alvarez with assaulting the police officer. They uh, ultimately, ultimately he accepted a plea that um, had him, uh, he had to uh, have some inpatient, uh, be in an inpatient treatment program as part of a probation, eight years of probation, but 
he didn't successfully complete the, in, the uh, treatment program, and so his probation was revoked, and he had to serve the eight years. Four years into those eight years, now, the, remember the videos, the, four, the internal affairs videos never made it to the criminal side. His lawyer never found out about it. He never found out about it. The, the, the prosecutors never found out about it. Ultimately, the lieutenant in charge said, boy, that was a terrible investigation that the criminal people never got those videos. But uh, ultimately, during the course, uh, while he's been in jail for four years, as part of an unrelated Section 1983 action, his lawyers, through discovery in a separate 1983 action, get those videos and realize that it turns out that Officer Adias was a big fat liar and there was no assault on the police officer. So they take those videos and now he's in the state system, in the criminal, in the, in the state system. They take those videos to the state court and he gets habeas relief. That very, very activist, liberal, all the time bending over backwards to help the criminal defendants tribunal, the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, gives him uh, habeas relief on the grounds that he is actually innocent on the basis of those videos. So at that point, he and all the charges are dismissed, and he is a free man. But he has now served four years in, in prison. So he brings a Section 1983 action against um, Officer Adias. And the question was whether uh, the, the case went forward. He sued Officer Adias and also the city of Brownsville, since he was a police officer. And the, the, ultimately, the officer was dismissed. And the case went forward against the city of Brownsville. And the, um, the, uh, the case was tried, um, and a significant a $2.3 million judgment, I believe it was, was rendered against the city of Brownsville, goes up to the Fifth Circuit. And what uh, there were sort of two layers of issues um, presented to the Fifth Circuit. One was the, whether the city of Brownsville could be liable under a Manel analysis, whether the city of Brownsville could be liable for the conduct of a police officer. Because in the context of Section 1983, of course, the, there's not a straightforward respondeat superior <coughs> where your employer is liable. There has, has to be a, a showing of uh, a decision by you know, a, a policymaker or a policy of the employer that, um, that leads directly, has a, a causal relation directly to the violation of the, of the constitutional right. So, so the, the, the sort of the first layer issue presented uh, to the Fifth Circuit on Bonk was an analysis of whether, whether the Manel factors were met here. And the court analyzed the, um, those issues and said no. Uh, it was not satisfied that there was no direct causal link between the, the, the city of Brownsville police policy, which is that there's a complete divide between the uh, administrative internal affairs analysis and the criminal investigation, and these folks don't communicate it at all. And the police chief at the top, in theory, everything that happens in internal affairs can go up the chain to the police chief, and then the police chief and only the police chief decides whether to send it back down to the criminal side. So, so that was the city of Brownsville's policy, and the question was whether that policy had a direct causal link to the constitutional injury, and the court said, no, it didn't. They analyzed it and said, no, it didn't. Just a series of incompetent decisions by individual officers led to this terrible situation, and, and besides, there's no deliberate indifference. But, the, but, but I think the, the, significant, the more significant jurisprudential issue analyzed here, probably why you, you picked it to be discussed today, uh, is the second question of whether the, uh, there is a Brady right in the context of a guilty plea as, as distinct from um, you know, a, a conviction after a trial. Right to the exonerated. Yes, evidence, uh, uh, to evidence. exculpatory evidence, whether you have a constitutional right to, to receive exculpatory evidence, which those videos would have been. And, and the court, this, this, is a, this is a crazy series. There are, I don't know, five, six different opinions uh, as part of this. So the court on Bonk determines that um, and, and it uh, discusses there is a circuit split um, that the Fifth Circuit says there is no Brady right in the context of a guilty plea. 
that they analyzed that the Brady right is a trial right, and its its purpose is to ensure that that uh, an accused criminal defendant receives a fair trial, and if you plead guilty, then there is no trial, uh, and so the purpose of Brady is not applicable, and therefore uh, we don't extend Brady here. Now the Supreme Court had never directly addressed the question of exculpatory evidence. They did decide a case where they said that uh, there is no constitutional right to impeachment information before a guilty plea. And the question really is whether exculpatory evidence for Brady purposes, is that the same thing or different than impeachment evidence? And the, and the Fifth Circuit said, no, it's the same thing. And we're going to say that um, there is no Brady right in that context. So, so uh, this is this is an, an instance like um, uh, Evan noted in the Whole Woman's Health um, opinion that that if you just you're reading through the facts, you know how it's going to come out because a date isn't just a date; it's it's the start of Holy Week. So you know how this one's going to come out at the end. Well, you know how this one's going to come out when you start reading the opinion and you see that every law enforcement actor is referred to as Officer Adias, uh, the uh, police chief so-and-so, um, the lieutenant this and that, sergeant so-and-so, Officer Carrejo, and Alvarez. Alvarez. Every single law enforcement person, actor, has an honorific, and the actually innocent individual Alvarez does not. And why? There's no reason to treat them differently for purposes of drafting this opinion. But you know that by when you start reading, you know how it's going to come out. And that's that's an aside. So there's a there's a series. Uh, Kyle, uh, you wanted to add something. Oh, no, I, I, I want to ask Jane a question. I see this was decided about a month ago. In light of the circuit split, is it clear yet whether there's going to be a cert petition filed or what the process for that's going to look like? I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I do have a question for Kyle, though. Uh, let's kind of focus on the issue of municipal liability. Um, do you think that perhaps the Monell standard that provides these four different highly complicated routes to uh, routes to holding uh, municipalities accountable um, is a better way of addressing situations of this nature than a respondeat superior? Uh, type of liability. Yeah, that, that's certainly a fair question. Sitting here as a lawyer for the state, I'd be hard pressed to say that Manel should be scrapped. It's something <laughs> that the state litigates regularly and is certainly used to, and not just the state, but governmental entities throughout Texas. In the event that a cert petition is filed here, as Jane correctly identified, there's two interesting issues. One relates to Manel liability. Uh, should that be scrapped? Is responding at superior a better uh, option? Uh, and then the issue of the expansion of Brady to the context of this case. I think that's something that the state would be interested uh, in weighing in on should this case reach the Supreme Court. Sure. Uh, anybody else wants to weigh in on the issue of municipal liability? I'll just say, I, I think Evan made, I think, a very telling point that I hope we don't lose sight of, which is we really ought not to think of these doctrines in a vacuum. Um, and that, you know, we tend to teach them somewhat independently until we get to exam time. Um, I think you know legal opinions tend to analyze them as if they were hermetically sealed from each other, and the reality is that they're not because they're, they're, in theory they're designed to shape conduct, and they're designed to deter wrongful conduct. Um, and so I just I don't I don't like the specter of sort of you know yay or boo Monell without a broader conversation about you know what the alternatives are and how we sort of closed off. I mean, one of the reasons why you see so many Monell type suits is because it's one of the only contexts in which the Supreme Court has said there's no immunity defense, um, right? That, that suing a municipality that is not an arm of the state where you actually can pursue a Monell like theory is I think the only context where you can sue any government or government officer for damages under you know, US law today and not have to worry about any kind of sovereign or official immunity defense. Um, and so we end up, so litigants end up trying to shoehorn their claims mm -hmm. into Monell-like theories mm -hmm. when perhaps they make more sense than other theories. But understandably, because the courts have perhaps wrongly um, chopped off other potentially more analytically satisfying modes of relief, right? So, so I guess I just, 
you know, I, I get frustrated by the sort of abstractness of it as opposed to, you know, how do we actually try to understand the way law should shape government conduct? And uh, by the way, a lawyer for Mr. Alvarez indicated that he is going to be filing cert petition, but there is no cert petition as of right now. Thank you very much to our panelists. I am sorry we didn't get to Collins versus Mnuchin, which is a fascinating decision uh, involving, a point, uh, in, in, involving a removal uh, of, um, uh, of a head of an agency. And I'm hoping, Kyle, that maybe we'll have you over to specifically talk about this case on one of our upcoming I'd podcasts. be delighted to. And thanks to the panel again. And thanks to the audience.